We have a treat this morning to gaze upon the Ten Commandments. We're walking through this series called Wandering, looking at at God guiding both Moses and Israel in, in the wandering through the wilderness, so to speak. And we've watched them come into Sinai and renew the covenant last week in Exodus 19. And we turn the page into Exodus chapter 20, and the Ten Commandments are given to Moses and to Israel. These are the the Ten Commandments. Like even, even in our world, if, if you go to Washington, D.C., to the Supreme Court building, and just walk around, eight times you will see Moses' image either carved in stone or on relief in some form. This is, if you, if you walk up the, the, the main steps of the, of the eastern steps, the relief right above your head, you'll walk under. Moses with, with the two tablets there. Beyond just the images of Moses, which are eight, you'll see images of of the actual tablets of the Ten Commandments. Right immediately behind where the Chief Justice sits, carved into wood, and on the inner chamber's doors, you'll see see the tablets of the Ten Commandments carved into both stone and wood. The Ten Commandments. Many people would say that this is the, the heart of the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the the covenant of God through Moses to Israel. I don't think I would call it the heart of that covenant. We can talk about that more. But broadly, there's confusion over the Ten Commandments, over the law as a whole. We might... We might fight for the Ten Commandments. We might say, we want the Ten Commandments. We we like those images of the Ten Commandments. But but even in this room, there's not a single person here who obeys at least number four on that list, remember the Sabbath day, not according to the law. I don't think anyone's been stoned lately for carrying wood into their home on the Sabbath day. And so... Oftentimes, we, we say the law is relevant, we uphold the law, we, we, we talk of the Ten Commandments and carry around the Old Testament, but we're not sure what to do with it. We're not sure how to apply it to our lives. Let's just read the, the opening of the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Number four, verse eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh, is it, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. God. Number five, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land and the Lord your God is giving you. And then it turns, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, etc. The Ten Commandments. I remember being four years old and, and memorizing at least the opening of the commands and the, and the commands in order. I still have it engraved in my mind. Master the Ten Commandments, M-A-S-T-C. So, so the, the Ten Commandments, the first four deal with our relationship with God and we're, we're fairly simple to grasp in order. You shall have no other gods before me, number one. You shall not worship idols, number two. You shall not misuse the the, the name of the Lord, number three. Then four, the Sabbath day. 
And then it turns outward. And everybody knows that starts with the most important one, honor your father and mother. Of course, it's your father and mother who teach you them. And then M-A-S-T-C, murder, adultery, stealing, testimony, coveting. Master the Ten Commandments. But what, what do we do with it? What does, the, what does the law look like as it's applied to our lives? Now we're going to spend kind of two weeks here. We could preach multiple sermons off of just each command. We could spend a long time here. But as an overview, I want to walk through five principles of the law that we have to grasp in order to understand any of the Ten Commandments, let alone the law itself. So we're going to walk through five principles. Principle number one, the law is powerless to save. The law is powerless to save. It cannot make anyone righteous. It never has, it never will. Moses, Daniel, Isaiah, Peter, Paul, Mary, none, none have been saved by the law. No one has ever been made holy by the law. No one has ever been saved by the law. In this sense, the law is not the heartbeat of the Old Covenant. I would say grace is the heartbeat of the Old Covenant. Abraham was saved by faith. You, you, saved ultimately by the blood of Jesus Christ. They were saved looking forward to the Messiah. We are saved living with him now and looking back when he came. The law is powerless to save. Consider these words, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, that's God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law can tell you you're a sinner, but the law cannot make anyone righteous. Every single human being outside of Jesus Christ has looked into the mirror of the law and seen the dirt in their own lives. The law cannot save, it does not make clean. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. For what the law was powerless to do. We, we know it intrinsically. We can memorize three by five cards all we want. I want to be a better dad. I want to be more patient. I want to have a, a better grasp of, of anger bubbling up in my life. I want to be more loving. I want to be more kind. We can, we can memorize. We can put it all. But we can't change ourselves. We can't reach inside our soul and make ourselves different. Neither can the law. The law can just tell us how we ought to behave, but it cannot change us inside. This, this is really the gospel. This is why Jesus is good news fundamentally. The law was powerless to save, and so God sent his son to wash away our sin and give us new birth, regenerate, to change our hearts, to give our, our spirits life, to change our minds, to internally change who we are, that we might be holy before God. The law cannot do these things. Hebrews chapter 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. It can never do it. It never has, it never will. The law cannot make righteous. And we see it all through the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament has a, a trajectory, an aim that points toward Jesus. It says, we're gonna use this sacrificial system even though we know it doesn't wash away sins. And we're going to use this law 
in order to honor God with our lives, even though we know every single one of us falls short and can't uphold it, and it cannot change us. But someday, God's going to send the Messiah. Someday, Jesus Christ is going to come, and he, he will give us a new heart and a new spirit inside. Listen to these words out of Ezekiel 36. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will do what the law could not do. It is important to grasp that the law has never, can never save or make righteous. Principle number two. The law is perfect. We, we, we slam the law. It sounds like, well, 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 if the law can't do anything, what, what, the, what, what good is the law? Consider these words out of Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The problem is not that the law isn't perfect. The problem is in here. We read it already in, in Romans chapter 8. If I go back there, Romans chapter 8, verse 3 for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. The law is perfect. The problem is you and I have sin inside. We have sin that dwells in us. We are born with the habit of crying to get what we want when we want it. The only thing that changes is the tone of our crying over time. We cry in different ways. We have sin. The law is perfect. So principle number one, the law is powerless to save. Principle number two, the law is perfect. Principle number three, the law is lasting. Lasting. Jesus said these words. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will any, by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Everything. So the law isn't going right. Well, you can say, well, if the law can't change us, and the problem is, is sin inside, what good is the law? Well, a couple of things here. So, training wheels are a good thing. If you are teaching a young, a young child how to ride a bike, training wheels can be a helpful tool to keep them upright until they can figure out their balance. The law, in many respects, is training wheels. The ideal is that we have the Spirit of God inside of us causing us to live holy lives in honor of God, to glorify Him with all we have. But because we have sin inside, because of our own immaturity, there are times law serves a purpose. I, re I remember when Deborah and I were dating. Sexual temptation was not... Uh, overwhelming. It was not like beyond what I could handle. And, and so life went on and it wasn't a big deal. And then we got engaged. And I don't know what switch flipped in my head, but it had to do with the sexuality part. That was for sure. And I figured out really quick, like night number one, whoa, buddy, this is trouble. In my life, what did that look like? It looked like law, a bunch of laws. Okay, we can see each other one night a week alone. One. We can see each other all we want during the day. We can see each other all we want with a group of friends. But if it's you and me sitting on a couch alone and no one else is home, one night a week, because that's all I can possibly handle. Two or three, poop, 
No, there's just not a chance. I don't have it in me to withstand that kind of pressure. No. Now, the ideal is that the Spirit of God would cause you to rise above temptation and live a holy life. But as long as we are weak, as long as we are immature, as we, long as we, we lack the ability to walk in the Spirit well, we need elements of training wheels in our lives. A young, a young person needs them more, perhaps, than a, as, as you mature, you need them less. But we all need training wheels at some level. That's, that's law. In addition to that, and this is going to be a tricky statement, but I'll share this with you. This is, is kind of a proverb that I live by in life. One of my top principles in life simply says this. Things go well when I obey God. That's the simplicity of it. In general, if I obey God, I've said this before, I think just better parking spots open up for me. (laughs) If I obey God in general, I, I, I think my finances are healthier. I think I'm a better dad. I think my marriage is better. I think I'm a better neighbor in general when I obey God. There are blessings inherent in the law. Now, you can stretch all of that too far, and we can all find examples of a disobedient person who is blessed and favored and an obedient person who has suffering in their lives. But as a general rule, that is true. Principle number one, Law is powerless to save. Principle number two, law is perfect. Principle number three, law is lasting. Principle number four, law is fulfilled. The law exists to bring us to Jesus. The law exists to point us to Jesus. The law is in many respects like a treasure map. It's a beautiful thing, a good thing. And even after you find the treasure, you honor the map. You put it in a big frame and you hang it on your wall and you look back with reminiscing at the goodness of that map. But no one would ever trade the map for the treasure. The treasure is Jesus. The map just points to him. And in this sense, the law is fulfilled. It's fulfilled. Consider consider these words. Hebrews chapter 8, one of the strongest in Scripture. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Pastor, are you saying, are you saying that the Old Testament is obsolete? Are you saying that the law is obsolete? Let me say it this way. There is not a single word or single letter anywhere in the Old Testament that applies directly to a Christian. There's not a single letter or single word of the Old Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the law, that applies directly to a Christian. But every letter and every word applies to Christians as they are fulfilled in Christ. All of it's relevant as it's fulfilled in Christ. We we no longer follow a law carved into stones. We follow Jesus. We follow the lawgiver, the king of creation. Now, the law of Christ that we follow has a lot of similarities to the law of the Old Testament because Jesus wrote both of them. But they have a lot of differences because the law of the Old Testament was given to a single nation and the law of Christ knows no national boundaries, the kingdom of God. And the law of the Old Testament was given to a people who did not have the Holy Spirit residing in them. They were not born again. They did not have regenerate hearts and minds. And in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, his kingdom does. So we follow Jesus. 
Now, what, what does that mean? It means that when we read the Old Covenant, when we read the law, we're asking ourselves continually, how is this fulfilled in Jesus? How does this apply to me in Jesus? Another passage in Romans chapter 10, verse 4. We read these words. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. It's the end of the law. Hebrews chapter 7. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Hebrews is saying, as long as the priesthood is the priesthood of Aaron, of the tribe of Levi, then you have one set of laws that govern it. But Jesus came not to be a high priest like the tribe of Levi. He's of the order of Melchizedek. It's a mysterious kingdomly priesthood. There's only one high priest ever been born, and that's Jesus. And when we follow Jesus, because he is a new high priest of a new order, he brings a new law with him. That law is fulfilled in him. The law is fulfilled. Last verse on this regard, Galatians chapter 3. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. It's essentially saying, saying the law was our training wheels until, until we had the spirit inside and we could ride on our own. And once we could ride on our own, we are no longer, we are no longer under the tutelage of training wheels. Now, how is the law of Christ fulfilled? Every law is a little bit different. The clearest examples we have are in Matthew chapter five. You have heard that it was said, do not murder, but I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. It's a much higher standard, the law of Christ, compared to the law. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery within his heart. Much higher standard. By the time you get to the last of those six examples Jesus gives us in Matthew chapter 5, he says, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And then five times he amplifies it. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now that's radical because, well, do not murder, there's a higher standard of do not have anger and do not commit adultery. There's a higher standard of not lusting. Here, here, eye for eye and tooth for tooth is fulfilled in a way that looks 180 degrees different than that. In fact, the last of those six examples in Matthew 5 totally does it. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. All that to say, when we read the Old Testament, when we read the law, different laws are fulfilled differently in Jesus. We, we, we could spend a whole series on just that. I, we can't stay here. Because the fifth principle is I think the most important. Reviewing the law is powerless to save, number one. Number two, the law is perfect. Number three, the law is lasting. Number four, the law is fulfilled. Number five, obedience is worship. Obedience is worship. What does that, what does that mean? It's an attitude issue as we approach law in all of its fullness. Obedience is worship. When I was a kid, I obeyed because there was a system of consequences built around my life. Those system of consequences 
involved rewards and punishments. I liked the rewards, I didn't like the punishments. And those consequences framed me. Still laugh with my family, so I was a swimmer as a kid. And my, my best swim meet ever was when I was eight years old, I set a record for the 50 meter backstroke. And my dad would talk to me, I'd be like, what, what, what sent you, what, what did this? Like, because it was, it was a great race, you know, the whole name in the paper, all of this kind of stuff, big record. Why did you, how, what, what pushed you through? So before the race, my mom told me if I won, she would buy me this brass belt buckle. <laughs> they had it at the, this little gift shop. It was a brass belt buckle with AAU on it. And for some reason, I was mesmerized by that belt. I wanted that belt buckle. I was motivated by rewards. If you get good grades, you get, you get these, these many dollars. You get a ski pass. You get this. If, if, if you don't, you lose computer time. You lose play, you know. That framed my life as a kid. And unfortunately, I'm not sure exactly how much I've matured. So I've known for quite a while that I pick up my phone too often while I drive. It's very easy if there's a question and I want an answer. I don't want to wait like three minutes. I want that answer now. Get, get, if you did, if you did, little Google, hey, what, what, what is? The phone rings. It's polite to answer. You open up the maps. You redirect the maps. You're gazing at the maps. So when Deborah is with me, she doesn't like that. And it's a regular thing in our lives for her to say, let me look that up for you. Let, and she'll take my phone, which is a big deal because her palms get sweaty when she looks at maps. <laughs> let me look that up for you. So literally for years, that has been the pattern in our lives. And then about six months ago, we shifted back to an older insurance company that we used to have, and they have an app and this app tracks all of your driving and it grades you on it and you can get a 30% discount if you use the app well. In six months, I haven't picked up my phone a single time. <laughs> Not once. So, so, so I, I, I don't know if it's, if it's because I'm Jewish and 30% off, just yes, please, like yes. <laughs> But, but put, put, put that picture back up there. So this is, this is mine and my wife's. In fact, uh, we didn't try this, but we were both on our way to work. So the one on the left is me getting to Katero Farms. I'm coming to church. That's her going down to the campus where she works. And, and you'll notice that currently both of our driving records are 95. So it's tied kind of, but not really, because if you go up above, so it says... It says um, phone handling, handheld calling, hands-free calling, harsh braking. But you'll see she has a one over there at phone handling. <laughs> so even though the scores are tied, I'm winning, baby. I'm winning. <laughs> and so evidently, I am motivated by rewards and by winning. And here's a poison if we don't catch this. If the law is a means to rewards and to winning in our lives, it will become a legalistic form of bondage that will rob us of joy and will rob us of relationship with God. If we become holy because we obey a law, if we feel more righteous because we obey a law, that is a poison that will shackle us and can literally tear down generations. For it is the anti gospel. 
and it pushes God away from us and relationally divides us and it puts us on a plane of earning our righteousness, earning our relationship, earning our favor with God. And it can't be done. And there is a fundamental principle here that says the law, obedience, is worship. It was never intended, ever, to try and earn something with God. You don't earn approval with God through the law. You don't earn righteousness with God through the law. You don't earn rewards with God through the law. Obedience is worship. In other words, you don't obey in order to get favor. You obey because you have favor. And this, this is a vital principle for us to get. Worship is the overflow of enjoyment with God. You're on that hike, you drink that cold glass of water, and after you know it, ah, that's worship. Worship is ah. Worship is, God, you have been so merciful. You have been so patient. You've been so loving. Ah, I want to worship you. I want to obey you. I want to follow you. I want to honor you. I want to glorify you with my life because of how good you are to me. Obedience is worship. It is a response to the goodness of God. It is not a means to try and earn it. And from the moment the Ten Commandments were given... We human beings have misunderstood all of these principles, really, but especially this. And we have used law to try and earn favor as opposed to obeying God because we have that favor. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we read these words. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. He's saying, obedience is worship. Obedience is, 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 is at the heart of worship. We receive God's goodness. We receive God's patience. We receive God's love. We receive his mercies. We receive his compassion. We say, God, I want to honor you today. I want to say thank you with my life today. And in doing that, the law is a beautiful thing to praise God with, to say thank you with. The law of Christ, the Old Testament law, to say thank you, God, for all that you have given. So we're going to come back here again next week looking at how the law was misunderstood. But I, I wish I could reach inside of your soul and take away any measure of legalism that has settled in. It is such a dangerous poison to feel better about ourselves because we obey a law as opposed to to just feeling better about ourselves because God's washed away our sin. Because the king of glory calls us, calls us worthy in Christ, delights in us. And then we use the law to say thank you. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, every one of us has set up law in our lives at times and made it the center of our relationship with you as if we're more holy because of what we do. Would you pull that out of us and help us just rest in the amazing, unfathomable reality that you as the King of glory delight in us May our lives, may our obedience say thank you this day and all through the week. 
In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we close.